it's my pleasure to have the opportunity to speak here this afternoon about my research on Mary Nemo Moran. Um, she was the subject of my doctoral dissertation, which I completed at the City University of New York's Graduate Center. Um, and I'm especially pleased to be here today in the Moran's old stomping ground of East Hampton uh, and to be speaking on the eve of the reopening of their home studio just down the street, which um, after my talk we'll have an opportunity to head down the block and, and um, they very generously will open the door so we can uh, see all of the hard work that they've been doing. It's a project that I've been watching with considerable interest over the past uh, several years and I'm really, really excited to see it come to fruition this summer. I just want to extend my thanks to the Ladies Village Improvement Society for inviting me to speak here this afternoon, uh, and especially Mary Kay Brennan for organizing the program and for inviting me to participate, um, and Richard Behrens and the East Hampton Historical Society as well for opening up the Clinton Academy. Uh, it's a thrill for me to be able to be standing in the space where the Morans once were and where they, their paintings and prints once hung, so thank you. <laughs> So the Moran story in East Hampton may be familiar to many of you, but less known is the story of how they ended up here, uh, and perhaps more importantly, why they decided to stay. So today I would like to tell this story, but do so through the lens of Mary Nemo Moran, an artist whose life and work has often been overshadowed by that of her husband, Thomas Moran. And this is true not only in our own era, where over the last four decades we've seen several exhibitions and publications dedicated to the work, uh, and very rightfully so, of Thomas Moran. Um, but this was also true, although to a slightly lesser extent, during the couple's own lifetime. In this 1876 photograph of the couple in their home studio in Newark, New Jersey, where they lived from 1871 to 1880 prior to moving here to East Hampton, uh, I believe we can look at this photograph and see the ways in which um, the couple had a very complex personal and professional relationship, as Mary Nemo Moran had to navigate the challenges of being both a wife and an artist, a mother and a professional, roles that in the 19th century were believed to be inherently contradictory. In the center of this photograph, dressed in a dark suit and seated in a Gothic Revival side chair, is Thomas Moran. He holds a round palette, paintbrushes, and a mall stick, all symbols of his status as a professional painter. Mary Nemo Moran sits behind her husband, reclining slightly in a state of reverie as she rests her head upon her left hand <laughs> in a melancholic pose. She gazes over Moran's shoulder, lost in thought, as she contemplates the landscape upon which he works. Although her positioning behind him suggests her secondary status, she's quite literally here seated in her husband's shadow, it also reveals, in my opinion, the incredibly vital role she played in supporting and facilitating Thomas Moran's career. In an unpublished biography, the couple's youngest daughter, Ruth Moran, credited her mother for much of Thomas's professional success. Uh, Ruth Moran wrote, quote, his relationship with Mary had always been warm and close and strong. His career as an artist had been a chief concern of hers. She had watched his work grow and had done all she could to smooth his way. She had been a canny manager, moreover, and had taken charge of many practical matters in order to leave Moran freer for his work. 22 years later, in 1898, the Morans were photographed in their winter studio, which was then located at 37 West 22nd Street in New York City. As in the 1876 photograph, Moran is seated at the center of the composition, holding a palette as he works on a monumental Venetian seascape. The most striking similarity between these two photographs, however, is the presence and position of Mary Nemo Moran. Wearing a tailored day dress, fashionable hat, and fur muff, she turns slightly away from the viewer, gazing over her husband's shoulder as he pursues his artistic ambitions. While the Morans do not acknowledge our presence in this photograph, an oil portrait of Mary Nemo Moran, painted by the artist Hamilton Hamilton in 1883, hangs on the studio's left wall. In this portrait, Nemo Moran directly engages the viewer, turning confidently to meet our gaze in a forthright gesture of self-assurance. 
There are few painted portraits of Mary Nimmo Moran that are known to survive, and none, to my knowledge, actually depict her as a working artist. Nevertheless, by the time Hamilton painted this in 1883, she was an accomplished landscape painter and printmaker. Her etchings, in particular, attracted critical acclaim on both sides of the Atlantic, leading one critic to write in uh, 1883, quote, the work of Mrs. Mary Nemo Moran demands particular notice. I doubt whether in the work of any etcher in America or in Europe are to be found more painter-like qualities than hers exhibit. And if I were to select the etching by an American artist which exhibited these qualities in the greatest profusion, I should unhesitatingly name her Twilight East Hampton. I am inclined to regard such a work as this as about the high watermark of etching in America. Here, as in other reviews of the era, she was praised for the bold, painterly quality of her work and celebrated not only as an innovative printmaker, but also as an influential interpreter of the American landscape. Although she is best known to us for her etchings, of East Hampton in particular, today, Nemo Moran did not begin working with this medium until 1879, more than two decades after she first began to pursue a career in the arts. So how did she get here? How did she become the leading American etcher? And what informed her approach to both art and nature? An approach that I believe was simultaneously modern and nostalgic, progressive and melancholic. And so to better understand her work, I believe we must begin with her upbringing. She was born in Straven, Scotland on March 16, 1842, the second child and first daughter of Archibald Nemo and Mary Scott. Her father had worked in Straven as a silk handloom weaver. However, by the 1840s, the widespread use of steam power dramatically transformed the textile industry, and increasing mechanization left many handloom weavers obsolete and unemployed. In 1847, when Mary Nimmo was just five years old, her mother died, most likely as a result of a cholera outbreak, which took place that year, and her father, who was then struggling to earn a living wage, decided, of course, along with millions of um, unemployed workers from the UK at this time, to seek out new opportunities in the new world. So in 1852, Archibald Nimmo, who was then age 36, his son, Archibald Nimmo Jr., who was 14, and his daughter, Mary Nimmo, emigrated from Scotland to the United States, settling in Crescentville, a township of northeastern Philadelphia. In the mid-19th century, Philadelphia was the textile center of the United States, with mills lining the Schuylkill River, providing thousands of immigrants with low-paying jobs. Upon his arrival in Philadelphia, Archibald Nimmo went to work as a weaver in one such textile mill, and his son would subsequently follow in his footsteps. As we now know, of course, Mary Nimmo embarked on a remarkably different path. Coincidentally, 1842, the year of Mary Nimmo's birth, was the same year that a handloom weaver by the name of Thomas Moran Sr. traveled to the United States from his hometown of Bolton, England. Located approximately 200 miles south of Straven, Bolton was also a textile producing town, described by the German philosopher and social scientist Frederick Engels as, quote, badly and irregularly built with foul courts, lanes, and back alleys reeking of coal smoke, and especially dingy from the original bright red brick turned black with time. Bolton, he wrote, was among the, quote, worst of these manufacturing towns. Even in the finest weather, it is a dark, unattractive hole. The angles did not hold back. <laughs> The Moran family was exposed to the worst effects of the Industrial Revolution, including unemployment, privation, and growing social unrest. And as a result of the bleak future of handloom weaving in Bolton, Thomas Moran Sr. set out in search of a more stable financial future in the United States. Two years after his immigration, he sent for his wife, Mary Hickson Moran, and their seven children, Edward, John, James, Sarah, Thomas Jr., Elizabeth and Peter, all of whom joined their father in Philadelphia in May of 1844. The Moran family first settled in Kensington, a working class suburb in Philadelphia. Um, and as was common among immigrant families, their father went to work in a textile will, as Mary Nemo's father had, and his children, including Thomas Moran Jr., who 
I will simply refer to as Thomas Moran from here on out, um, were educated in Philadelphia's public school system. However, due to Kensington's increasing congestion, uh, the family was forced to move to Crescentville, approximately five miles to their north, where they rather fortuitously moved into a home neighboring that of the Nimmo family. <laughs> the year was 1858, and Mary Nimmo was just 16 years old when she first met Thomas Moran, who was already on his way to a successful career as a landscape painter. In 1853, at the age of 16, Moran's father had entered him into an apprenticeship at the Philadelphia engraving firm of Scattergood and Telfer. Although scheduled to last seven years, Moran left the firm abruptly after only two years, instead deciding to pursue a professional career as a landscape painter. He moved into the studio of his brother Edward Moran, who was the oldest of the Moran children and the first in the family to pursue a career in art professionally. And then Thomas essentially taught himself how to paint. He took informal lessons with his brother. He studied the work of local Philadelphia, whoops. Oh, there we go, excuse me. He studied the work of local uh, Philadelphia artists, including James Hamilton, who was an Irish-born artist working in Philadelphia in the 1850s and 60s, most notably in the medium of watercolor, one that Moran would later adopt and master himself as well as the German-born landscape painter Paul Weber, also working in Philadelphia in the 40s and 50s, uh, mostly in the woodlands around the city. In addition to these visual resources, Thomas Moran was a vociferous reader. He was heavily influenced by the writings of the English critic John Ruskin, which were frequently published in American periodicals. Moran read Ruskin's Modern Painters and the Elements of Drawing, the latter an instructional manual devised for what Ruskin called the isolated student. In this text, Ruskin promoted drawing directly from nature. He instructed students to begin by studying a single leaf, expanding their visual repertoire gradually over time. Moran heeded Ruskin's truth to nature advice, and in the 1850s and 60s made several plein air sketching trips along the banks of the Schuylkill River. He remained devoted to plein air study throughout his career, and it was the single most important lesson that he would later pass on to his most assiduous student, Mary Nemo Moran. However, perhaps most influential upon Thomas Moran's uh, artistic development was the work of the British landscape painter J.M.W. Turner. Moran initially studied prints that were made after Turner's original paintings, and he would later travel to London to see and study Turner's work firsthand, executing watercolor copies after examples of his paintings and prints, just one example we see here. During the years of his courtship with Mary Nemo, which lasted from 1858 to 1863, uh, five years, a considerably long time, especially by the standards, I think, of the 1850s, the artist worked tirelessly to establish himself as a noteworthy new figure in Philadelphia's art scene. And while these years were incredibly influential for Thomas Moran, essentially lying the foundation upon which he built his future career, they also proved to be decisive for Mary Nemo, marking her first introduction to the world of art and to art making. The couple was finally married on February 9th, 1863, at the Church of the Assumption, Blessed Virgin Mary, in northern Philadelphia. The newlyweds then moved into Thomas Moran's studio, and it was at this point that Mary Nemo's artistic education is believed to have begun. She obtained her training from her husband in the home and at no cost. She studied, <laughs> which was a, for two young artists, I think, starting up in Philadelphia, a critical uh, point. <laughs> She studied from Moran's drawings, watercolors, and oil paintings, and she had access to the books in his library, which included, of course, copies of Ruskin's writings, as well as prints after Turner's paintings. It appears unlikely that Nemo Moran ever received any formal artistic training, as there's no record of her enrollment in either the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts or the Philadelphia School of Design for Women, which were the two leading institutions of the era. For the majority of female artists who were working in the 19th century, marriage, followed uh, almost immediately by motherhood, made a professional career difficult, if not impossible, to pursue. Women often abandoned their careers after marriage, or conversely, and perhaps more commonly, chose to remain single, since domestic duties would significantly interfere with their professional aspirations. And in this regard, Mary Nemo Moran's experience is somewhat unique 
since it was precisely her marriage to Thomas Moran that opened rather than closed the doors to a career in the arts. She later acknowledged that, quote, from Thomas Moran came all of my first impressions of art and of nature as applied to art. Up to that time, I had never thought of using the brush or the pencil. An important moment in Mary Nemo Moran's artistic education came in June of 1866, when she, Thomas Moran, and their young son, Paul Nemo, who was uh, just two years old at the time, traveled to Europe. They began their trip in London in order for Mary Nemo to see the work of Turner firsthand, and then shortly thereafter made their way to Paris, uh, where they spent approximately nine months renting a studio not far from the Luxembourg Gardens. After the Civil War, speedier ocean crossings and large expatriate communities made Paris the mecca for American art students. It was filled with galleries, museums, exhibitions, and academies offering young American art students, both male and female, with incredible opportunities for cultural immersion. A period of study in Paris was an essential component of any artist's education in the late 19th century, and by 1870 it was almost viewed as a kind of prerequisite towards professionalization. While they were abroad, they connected with other American artists who were studying overseas, including Thomas Aikens and William Truss Richards. However, unlike many of their American contemporaries, the Morans did not pursue a formal course of training. They didn't enroll in an academy or study in an atelier, and instead followed their own personalized curriculum, which included extended visits to the Louvre, where they studied old master paintings, particularly the landscapes of the 17th century French painter Claude Lorraine, and then the couple supplemented their studies in the Louvre with frequent visits to the French countryside. Perhaps their most important sketching trip was to the famed Forest of Fontainebleau, a forest that had inspired the work of generations of French landscape painters known at the time as the Barbizon School. The Morans spent time sketching the forest landscape from the foliage of Fontainebleau's oaks and pine trees to its celebrated rock gorges. And then upon returning to Paris, they would visit the urban studio of Camille Corot, or Papa Corot, as he was known at the time, for his role as the founding father of the Barbizon School. And although it's unknown precisely which works the Morans saw while they visited Corot's studio, Thomas Moran would later recall that during their visit, Corot was painting from memory, quote, those gray pictures that you see in every American auction. Thomas Moran would later refer to the men of the Barbizon school, including Thoreau, excuse me, including Corot and Theodore Rousseau, as, quote, all men of one idea who paint forever the forests of Fontainebleau. And yet, despite his rather disparaging comments towards the Barbizon school, I believe that this sketching trip to the Forest of Fontainebleau and then the visit to Corot's studio had an incredible impact upon the later landscape etchings of Mary Nemo Moran. There are many parallels between the aesthetic she adopted when portraying America's eastern seaboard, most notably East Hampton, and the romantic works um, of the Barbizon artists, who often emphasize a naturalistic and subjective approach to nature, often painting and etching these very small, intimate corners of the landscape. And I'll just note, um, this print on the top here is actually also hanging on the back wall, so you'll have a chance to, to see it in the flesh shortly. <coughs> The couple eventually returned to the United States in 1867 after this extended and really influential period of study. Uh, and just one month later, Mary Nemo Moran gave birth to her second child and first daughter, Mary Scott Moran. There are very few extant works by Mary Nemo Moran from this period of her career. As a mother of two, it's likely that her family duties greatly limited her artistic output. But nevertheless, in 1869, just two years after returning from Paris, she made her professional debut at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, exhibiting an oil painting entitled A Wood Scene. And unfortunately, the location of this work is still unknown, uh, but a pencil sketch completed by the artist later that year may reveal something of the sort of compositional and stylistic appearance of the original painting. Signed M. Moran and dated October 12, 1869, it's her earliest extant work and depicts a forest interior. In the middle ground, a small waterfall meets a stream flanked on either side by trees that create this really beautiful arch, uh, natural arch in the composition. The sketch was most likely executed on the spot in a Pennsylvania forest where she and Moran often drew out of doors, gathering the raw materials for their finished paintings. 
Similar to her husband's works from this period, she played, paid close attention to the variety of natural forms, rendering trees, leaves, rocks, and individual blades of grass with equal consideration. Now, despite these initial efforts, her pursuit of a professional career was further complicated the following year of 1870, when she gave birth to then the couple's third child and second daughter, Ruth Bedford Moran. And at this point, it appears that whatever painting career Mary Nemo Moran may have been attempting to sort of get off the ground, uh, it almost came to a halt, as family and domestic duties soon overwhelmed her ability to create art. And this was, of course, one of the greatest difficulties facing many women artists in the 19th and continuing well into the 20th centuries. Um, as a professional career really required a degree of time and dedication that was outside the boundaries of traditional female activities, primarily homemaking and child rearing. And then pursuing art, pursuing art making was considerably more challenging for Mary Nemo Moran once her husband Thomas began traveling out west on government survey expeditions, leaving her alone with the family for several months at a time. He accompanied both the Hayden and Powell geological surveys to Yellowstone in 1871 and the Grand Canyon in 1874, which inspired a series of monumental canvases, uh, examples of which you see here. And both of these works were eventually purchased by the United States Congress, solidifying his reputation as a great painter of the American West. Interestingly, in 1872, Mary Nemo accompanied her husband on her first and only Western expedition. Traveling from New York, the couple crossed the country by train, eventually arriving in Yosemite's, uh, California Yosemite Valley. The couple spent several weeks drawing Yosemite's famed sites, including North Dome and Half Dome, Glacier Point, Bridalville Falls, and Yosemite Falls, which we see here in a watercolor by Mary Nemo Moran. In this work, she adopted a distance perspective in order to emphasize the verticality of the falls. The viewer stands on the valley floor before a shallow pool of water that narrows as it recedes to the base of the lower fall. Painted in thin washes of blue, red, and brown, the water surface seems to reflect the colors and forms of the surrounding landscape. Nemo Moran captured the real serenity of Yosemite's landscape, a site, interestingly, which by the time of the Moran's visit was hardly a scene of unspoiled wilderness, but rather a popular tourist destination, although she seems to have eliminated all signs of tourism and development from her finished work. In addition to this watercolor, she also completed a study of Half Dome, executed in black and gray wash. Likely painted on the spot, the work appears to represent the same site featured in Moran's later watercolor of Yosemite's Half Dome. In both works, an outcropping of jagged rocks, flanked on the right by pine trees, is set against the rising peaks of a distant mountain. While Moran adopted an elevated perspective, what some scholars have referred to as his magisterial gaze, uh, which allows us to kind of survey the landscape from up above. Mary Nemo Moran chose a much, much closer point of view. In her work, the viewer stands amidst the boulders at the cliff's edge. She cropped out the distant snow-capped mountains, focusing our attention on the nearest peaks. She included only two spruce trees on the right, simplifying the composition and paring it down to far fewer elements than are present in Moran's work. Throughout her career, Nemo Moran's preference for these small, intimate views over the more panoramic perspective of her husband really helped to uh, differentiate her from his work. She would later draw on her experiences in Yosemite when commissioned to contribute an etching to the serial publication, Picture Us California and the region west of the Rocky Mountains from Alaska to Mexico. This was a luxury volume of essays and prints edited by the renowned naturalist John Muir. The print, which depicts the towering redwoods of a forest interior, accompanied Muir's essay on Yosemite Valley. And although she seems to have been inspired by her Western travels, her 1872 trip to Yosemite was the only one she made during her lifetime, although she did travel with more frequency along the eastern seaboard, making it as far north as Niagara Falls and as far south as Florida, while making at least one return trip to Europe as well. Her husband, in contrast, continued to travel west and beyond throughout his career. And in fact, the following year of 1873, Moran returned west, this time visiting Utah. The artist was traveling on commission and upon return was required to submit drawings and watercolors that served as the basis for wood engravings to be published in popular monthly magazines. 
The demand for Moran's illustrative work in the early 1870s was so high that he actually decided to move his family from Philadelphia to Newark, New Jersey, where he could be closer to New York City's thriving publishing industry. During the 1870s, he executed hundreds of works for reproduction and publication, an output that has been described both in his lifetime and ours as superhuman. And so this might lead one, and it certainly led me, to wonder if Moran might have had any assistance in producing any of these works. <laughs> a very telling letter written by Moran from Utah in 1873 to his wife sheds some light on the matter. He advised Mary Nemo to, quote, work hard to improve your drawing, dear, as I shall have plenty of work for you this coming winter. <laughs> 70 drawings for Powell, 40 for Appleton, 20 for Scribner's, all from this region, besides the watercolors and the oil pictures. While Moran wrote this letter to his wife in the summer of 1873, she was in fact diligently drawing her local landscape, developing her observational skills and drafting abilities. She spent three months, June, July, and August, traveling around the Delaware Water Gap, where the Delaware River cuts through the Appalachian Mountain Ridge between New Jersey and Pennsylvania. She produced 23 known works during the summer, including two um, wash drawings, which you see here. And several of these works are carefully dated and labeled with locations, which has enabled me to track her movements throughout the region that summer. In addition to her more finished sketches, such as these, in which we see her experimenting with wash and adding white chalk to, to create highlights in the landscape, she also traveled around the forests of eastern Pennsylvania and New Jersey, carefully sketching and studying individual trees and rocks. Works such as these reveal her adherence to the teachings of the English critic John Ruskin and remind me of the very early tree drawings executed by the landscape painter Thomas Cole, who, like the Morans, arrived in the United States as an economic migrant, displaced by Britain's Industrial Revolution. Cole, like Mary Nemo, spent expense, extensive time in his early career sketching individual tree types in the forests of Pennsylvania where he was living with his family in the 1820s. And I've just finished working on a large exhibition on Thomas Cole at the Met, so now I see Thomas Cole everywhere I look. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, now the precise nature of Nemo Moran's assistance uh, with her husband's illustrative work is difficult to know or to prove. Any of the work she may have had a hand in producing were signed solely by Thomas Moran, and there is therefore no overt acknowledgement of her assistance in their execution. However, I believe it's most likely that she assisted him with transferring his on-the-spot sketches, which he would execute in either graphite or watercolor, to woodblocks, which were then delivered to the publisher to be carved, printed, and published. Now there's one example of an uncarved woodblock by Mary Nemo Moran, currently in the collection of the Met, that speaks to her practice of drawing directly onto a woodblock. This is a view of Cupica Bay on the Isthmus of Panama, which she drew onto a woodblock using wash and ink. Now, there, despite previous assertions, um, there is actually no indication that she ever traveled to Panama, but instead was working from photographs of her brother-in-law, so Thomas Moran's brother, John Moran, who had accompanied the government-sponsored Darien expedition to Panama in 1871. The transfer of John Moran's photographs to woodblocks, which were in turn intended for engraving and publication, reveals that this was in fact a practice that she was familiar with, and in my opinion, it's not too much of a leap then to assume she would have been doing similar work for her husband. Um, to return briefly to the photograph from the beginning of my talk, I want to also emphasize that in addition to her artistic assistance, she also played an incredibly important role in supporting her husband. Her assistance came in the form of domestic work, including housekeeping and child rearing, as I've mentioned previously, as well as professional support as she managed both his business and social affairs. And the commitment she de uh, demonstrated to her familial obligations, often at the expense of her own artistic productivity, made much of Thomas Moran's early success possible. And his remarkable productivity should be understood as the direct result of her dedicated efforts. And as daughter Ruth Moran later noted, it was her mother's sacrifices that ensured he could devote himself entirely to art making. Ruth Moran wrote this um, amazing passage about her, the relationship between her mother and father, writing, quote, Mary Nemo Moran was never a prolific painter, as her children and home and numberless friends were always coming to the studio in Newark, New Jersey, 
and then also later in East Hampton. She was always assisting and criticizing Thomas Moran with his work, protecting and stimulating him, and giving all that there was in her to developing and flowering of that genius that she had always seen was in Thomas Moran. Um, and it was, excuse me, um, and in that great measure owed its almost superhuman versatility and productiveness to her great love that always stood between him and the little petty troubles of just living. The butcher, the baker, the candlestick maker, someone must go to see them, and that someone was this busy woman, companion, homemaker, mother, artist, and friend. Writing in 1900, the artist Anna Leah, uh, Anna Leah Merritt astutely noted that pursuing a professional career was especially challenging without the assistance of a wife. In a letter to artists, especially women artists, she addressed the critical difficulty slowing women's progress. Quote, the chief obstacle to a woman's success is that she can never have a wife. Just reflect what a wife does for an artist. Darns the stockings, keeps the house, writes his letters, visits for his benefit, wards off intruders, is personally suggestive of beautiful pictures, always an encouraging impartial critic. It is exceedingly difficult to be an artist without this time-saving help. <laughs> and then my favorite part, a husband would be quite useless. He would never do any of these disagreeable things. <laughs> Now, Merritt's list of disagreeable chores closely echoes precisely that which Ruth Moran wrote about her mother assisting her, other, uh, her husband with. And yet, despite these manifold responsibilities, Nemo Moran nevertheless continued to produce art during the 1870s, even if in a somewhat limited capacity. Between 1877 and 1879, she published a series of wood engraved illustrations in popular magazines, such as the Aldean, signing her own name to these works. Well, only, only signing them her own name, sort of. <laughs> On the left-hand side, you see she used the very cryptic pseudonym of uh, Mary Nemo, spelled N-E-M-O. Uh, and in the illustration on the left, it's actually attributed to Mrs. Thomas Moran. Uh, both of these works are scenes of the tropics. Again, there's no, not, there's no really uh, indication that she ever traveled there herself. So they were likely inspired by John Moran's photographs, um, such as the example we saw earlier. Now, by the late 1870s, and perhaps as a result of her children growing older and some of her responsibilities um, uh, lessening, she turned her attention back to landscape painting. Although she had begun her career uh, ever so briefly working in this medium, debuting at the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts in 1869, she did not publicly exhibit another landscape painting until 1877, eight years later. Entitled Autumnal Twilight, the work was shown at the National Academy of Design in New York City, uh, where it was listed for sale at, one, at the price of $150. Um, over the course of the next five years, she actually exhibited five works at both the Pennsylvania Academy and the National Academy of Design, and thus far I've been able to track down two examples of these works, uh, both of which you see here. On the left is her Nork from the Meadows, exhibited at the National Academy in 1879, and on the right, her Long Island landscape, East Hampton, uh, exhibited at the NAD in 1880. She also continued her work with watercolor, executing this really beautiful view of East Hampton using very broad strokes of a kind of bluish purple wash, capturing the most basic elements of the landscape, notably water and sky with a few houses and that windmill that she always stuck into her compositions, the sort of symbol of East Hampton. Um, and we appears to have these two small figures in a boat in the foreground. In 1878, uh, Nemo Moran and her family made their first trip to East Hampton. They were encouraged to visit the town at the suggestion of close friend William McKay Laffin, a journalist, painter, and member of the Bohemian art collective known as the Tile Club. In 1878, Laffin arranged for club members to participate in an extended sketching trip across the 120-mile stretch of land from Brooklyn to Montauk Point which resulted in the publication of a popular article in Scribner's Monthly that was illustrated with sketches that artists executed on this journey, uh, such as the example you see here on the right. Of all of the sites visited, Tile Club members found East Hampton to be the most attractive, and they were struck by its seemingly sort of untouched character, reporting that, quote, our tourists came out upon a scene of freshness and uncontaminated splendor, such as they had no idea existed 100 miles from New York City. The article also pronounced East Hampton to be a, quote, painter's gold mine, all bits and nuggets, 
And club member Arthur Quarterly compared it to a Renlaw beauty in the presence of a Reynolds, all the time posing for effect. Although the Tile Club um, is often credited with discovering East Hampton as a kind of artistic destination, Long Island's East End inspired artists and writers dating back to the 18th century, and it was a popular spot with landscape painters even as recently as the early 1870s, when Winslow Homer and John Ferguson Weir captured scenes of oceanfront recreation, featuring the multitude of overheated urbanites who populated the town and continue to populate the town in the summer months. The Moran's first excursion to the East End lasted only a few weeks. However, by, the 18, by 1880, they were spending up to six months of the year in East Hampton, painting and etching the local landscape, which served as a major source of inspiration throughout the remainder of their careers. The couple was really drawn to the area's diverse topography, um, which offered, as one critic wrote, quote, Rural nooks for the landscape painter, beach and sea panoramas, stormy cloud battles, or shimmering calm for the marine painter, all of which uh, very much appealed to both Mary and Thomas Moran. Moreover, the recent extension of the Long Island Railroad made East Hampton easily accessible from New York City, where the couple always maintained a winter studio. And their proximity to the urban center allowed them to maintain close ties with art dealers, collectors, printers, and publishers. In many ways, East Hampton's rise as an artist's retreat mirrored the development of the colony of Barbizon in France, which had attracted generations of landscape painters from Paris beginning in the 1830s. Another parallels between these two artist colonies um, were noted even as early as 1883, when Lippincott's magazine declared East Hampton to be the American Barbizon, overrun as it was by artists working on plein air or out of doors. Of course, artists were not the only ones who were drawn to East Hampton in the 19th century. The extension of the railroad also facilitated travel for tourists. And while many celebrated the extension of the railroad, for instance, uh, the New York Times described it as a, quote, godsend to tired New Yorkers, others, including many of the artists working in East Hampton, were averse to the influx of tourists, lamenting the loss of Long Island's seclusion and simplicity. And in many regards, East Hampton was a microcosm of the nation during the Gilded Age, as America was rapidly growing and changing in the face of fast-paced industrialization. And as a result, many believed that the country was beginning to lose its rural and moral character. This is a theme that plays out in many of Mary Nemo Moran's landscapes, as she romantically painted and etched America's pastoral landscape nostalgically preserving the nation's rural past at the precise moment that it was quickly beginning to disappear. The same year that the Morans first visited East Hampton, 1878, was also the year that Thomas Moran purchased an etching press for the couple's studio, still then located in Newark, New Jersey. Although Th Thomas Moran had begun his career as a printmaker, apprenticing in an engraving firm, his new interest in etching reflected the spirited revival of the medium in America. Inspired by trends in French and English printmaking, American artists began to use etching not simply for reproductive purposes, as it had previously been employed, but instead as a means of creating original and expressive works. The American etching revival, as the uh, movement came to be known, began in the late 1860s, when a Frenchman by the name of Alfred Cadart made two trips to the United States to exhibit French etchings in an attempt to establish an etching society on this side of the Atlantic. His efforts, unfortunately, were short-lived, and it was not until after the 1876 centennial that the popularity of this medium began to grow in the United States. Etching was a particularly appealing medium to landscape painters dating all the way back to the 17th century. It was used by Rembrandt, an example of which you see on the left, as well as um, later artists working in France, such as members of the Barbizon School. Um, and we have an example by Charles Daubigny here. Landscape painters loved the portability of coated copper plates, which allowed artists to practice freehand etching, drawing their subjects directly onto their prepared plates while out of doors. In the United States, early proponents of the medium promoted etching as uniquely American. Publisher Frederick Keppel, for instance, wrote, quote, the genius of our national character and the genius of painting etching, as original etching was called, have this in common that both are practical, rapid, and direct, 
disliking and avoiding all that is tedious and superfluous, and desiring above all to arrive at the essential core of things. Additionally, etching was believed to be a particularly suitable medium for women to pursue. The process of etching, in which a needle is used to incise a prepared copper plate, was viewed as a logical extension of the art of drawing, which by the 1870s was a regular component of upper and middle class women's education. Women were said to have a kind of natural affinity for drawing, and in the process, uh, and as a result, etching was a kind of logical uh, next step for many women artists. In fact, women had been among the earliest practitioners of etching in America. As early as the 1840s, Sarah Cole, the sister of Thomas Cole, is known to have produced etchings, although unfortunately none of those survive today. And in 1868, Eliza Greatorix, who we see here, displayed an etching at the annual exhibition of the National Academy of Design. And she was the first American artist, uh, either male or female, to exhibit an etching in the United States. Throughout the 1870s, 80s, and 90s, as etching's popularity continued to grow, so too did the number of women who excelled as painter etchers. Etching was soon included in the curriculum at women's design schools, such as the Philadelphia School of Design, and documentation reveals that there were more than 70 trained female painter etchers working in the United States in the 1880s at the height of the medium's revival. Etching was therefore a medium in which women could compete on equal ground, and in the case of uh, Mary Nemo Moran, and in my humble opinion, even surpass many of their male contemporaries. In the summer of 1879, one year after purchasing an etching press for his New York studio, Thomas Moran was set to embark on yet another Western trip. Prior to leaving, however, he left his wife with five coated copper plates, encouraging her to try her hand at etching. The first etching that Nemo Moran produced was a landscape rendered completely from memory of the St. John's River in Florida, where the Morans had traveled just two years prior. Although the original plate is now lost, there is one extant impression currently in the collection of the Gilcrease Museum. Affixed to the mat is a label printed for a later exhibition, which reads, quote, first experiment etched on the back of a visiting card plate. Ruth Moran explained that her mother executed this work, quote, not wishing to ruin the other five plates that Thomas Moran had left her. It was actually common practice for first time etchers to experiment on a small piece of copper when learning to clean, ground, draw, bite, and then print a plate. It's a very long, laborious process. In his introductory chapter to an American edition of a treatise on etching, the um, critic and later um, curator of prints at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, Sylvester Curler, advised his readers to, quote, not waste your money on a large plate. A visiting card plate is sufficiently large. If you happen to have one um, lying around, you can use the back of it. And then Ruth Moran recalled her mother working on the back of one such visiting card plate, writing that she, quote, took her card plate, coated at herself, and then made some wriggles, as she called them, for a tree, <laughs> a few lovely lines for water, and there it was, it was enough. Now, the, the large size of the image on the screen belies that it's actually only one and seven, eight inches high by four and a quarter inches wide. Um, but it, in this experimental test plate, it sort of, it depicts three small boats that were being manned by these rather rudimentarily outlined figures who are visible in the foreground. On the distant riverbanks, buildings peek through the trees, uh, the leaves of which are rendered with simple hatching and cross hatching. And to the left, there is a thinly etched line that delineates the horizon, creating a clear division between water and sky. Ruth Moran noted that after drawing this plate and biting it with acid, her mother, quote, took one impression only, but the result was so encouraging that she continued and used all five prepared plates. Ruth Moran was only nine years old at the time, but she later recognized the significance of this moment in her mother's career. She recalled that after successfully drawing, biting, and printing the St. John's River, Florida print, which we see here, Nemo Moran then, quote, took next, the next day a child in one hand and a plate in the other <laughs> and sat down by the side of the old bridge over the Delaware. I remember the excitement of her, though I was a very little child at the time. Some critics of her work consider this plate to be as good as any that she has done. The etching that Ruth Morans refers to uh, was exhibited and published under the title Bridge Over the Bushkill, Easton, Pennsylvania, seen here on the left. 
and it was one of two plates that Nemo Moran etched in Pennsylvania that summer, the other entitled Bridge over the Delaware Eastern PA. Both works were executed out of doors or on plein air, as the artist recalled taking her plates, quote, directly to nature and working entirely out of doors, and this was a practice she used throughout her entire career. And it's also a practice that distinguishes many of her prints from those of her husband, who often preferred to compose his etchings from the studio. Upon his return from out west, Moran was apparently shocked by his wife's progress, and as she... <laughs> And as she later wrote, he found her style to be, quote, so original that he hardly knew what to say. <laughs> Nemo Moran had etched, bitten, and printed the five plates Moran left her, and he subsequently sent four of these works to the New York Etching Club, the first and most prominent society dedicated to promoting etching in the United States. Nemo Moran was then unanimously accepted as a member. It's worth noting, however, that her works were always signed M. Uh, Nemo, or sometimes M. Nemo Moran, and members of the club apparently accepted the artist under the impression that she was a man. <laughs> Nevertheless, this success encouraged her to continue working in the medium, and over the next two decades, she emerged as a preeminent American printmaker. Her early etchings, which she produced between 1879 and 1883, uh, depict three local landscapes, the first being Newark, New Jersey, where the Morans lived until 1881, and interestingly, she focused on Newark's, um, both its pastoral, sort of Arcadian landscape, which you see on the left, but also on the industrial presence in the landscape, which was a subject she had previously explored in one of her paintings. In addition to Newark, she also etched views of New York City, where her and Moran always maintained a winter studio. And this is a particularly interesting work, and it speaks to the ways in which Mary Nemo Moran was always interested in this theme of nostalgia. It keeps coming back over and over again. Uh, this is a work that depicts 55th Street in New York City, very different than what it looks like today. And she includes uh, the newly built brownstones on the left-hand side of the composition, but those aren't her primary interests. She was primarily interested in this small little farm, um, city farm, and all of these farms were being uh, essentially raised um, and gotten rid of as a result of the new construction. So it's a really nostalgic image, one that's sort of preserving New York City's picturesque past. And then finally, uh, East Hampton, where they summered each year, eventually building their home studio in 1884. Now, remarkably, many of the etchings she produced during these early years were incredibly innovative. She experimented with a number of printmaking processes, often et uh, mixing etching with mezzotint, dry point, and monotype. She also incorporated various tools and techniques into her etchings, working with sandpaper, scotch stone, the roulette, plate tone, and retroussage. The latter is a technique in which a cloth is wiped across an inked plate to draw up the ink and soften the printed lines. Um, these are techniques that ensured that no two impressions would, were exactly the same. And she used retroussage in both of these works. Uh, you can see it where she's created the very soft painterly effects, both in the sky and along the sandy path. By employing a variety of processes and techniques, Nemo Moran enhanced the tonal and painterly quality of her etchings, emphasizing each print's originality. And originality was really the defining characteristic of the etching revival, as the medium was being used not for reproductive purposes, but instead to create works that were unique and individualistic, closer in character to painting than traditional printmaking. And in fact, these works came to be known as painting uh, painting etchings and the artists themselves as painter etchers. Here you can see that she actually, uh, in the print on the right hand side, selectively used wiping and plate tone so that the foreground is almost completely cleared of ink when you compare it to the work uh, on the left. And the sky on the right, um, she more heavily inked it and she kind of loses some of the um, tonal variations that you see in the work on the left. And so she was always constantly experimenting with the ways in which she could use ink in various manners to create different effects in her finished uh, impressions. Um, and in this work, Study of Scrub Oak Amagansett of 1881, she actually applied a piece of sandpaper to the surface of the plate, creating these small stippled indentations, which you can see in the detail there, that recreate the appearance and texture of actual sand in the landscape. She also applied dry point, uh, using a needle to incise directly into the plate with no ground, which you can see in the lines that were used to create the grass, 
Um, and it creates this sort of this sense of softness and it's a very um, rich textured line that recreates the natural effects that she herself was observing in nature. Uh, furthermore, the artist worked in various colored inks, creating tonalities in black, gray, brown, and sepia tones, and she often printed impressions on a variety of papers. Um, so here we have examples of both brown ink and black ink. You can see the different effects she's able to achieve. And then also working, as I said, in different paper. She often worked with handmade wove paper, laid paper, Japan paper, um, and she even successfully printed several works on silk as well, which you can see an example of on the uh, right-hand side. Working with a diverse array of inks and papers was what yet another means by which she could ensure that her etchings were truly distinct and one of a kind. And I believe that the innovative nature of Nima Moran's work and her willingness to freely experiment with these various processes and techniques reflects her status as an essentially self-taught printmaker. Because she was not formally trained in an academy or printmaking studio, she did not adhere to conventional modes of printmaking. Furthermore, I would argue that it was precisely this original and experimental quality of her work that was so appealing to publishers and collectors of the era as her painting etchings met the market's growing demand for unique handmade objects in the face of increased mechanization and mass production. In 1881, only two years after she uh, first picked up her etching needle, Nemo Moran was featured in a series of articles on the works of American etchers written by Sylvester Curler in the American Art Review. Curler was a German-born critic and a fierce advocate for etching in the United States, um, and he would go on to become the first curator of prints at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and later at the Smithsonian in Washington, DC. He praised her work, publishing um, this depiction, Solitude of 1880, in his periodical. And he wrote of Mary Nemo Moran, quote, in etching, Miss Moran finds a language that accords entirely with her ideas and modes of expression. She treats her subjects with poetical disdain of detail, but with a firm grasp of leading truths that give force and character to her work. While her etchings do not display the smoothness that comes from great mechanical dexterity, her touch is essentially that of a true etcher, nervous, vigorous, and rapid, and bitten in with a thorough appreciation of the relations of needle and acid, preferring robustness of line to extreme delicacy. He then went on to describe the admirable qualities of her landscape seen, for instance, in a work uh, such as this entitled Sandy Paps, writing, quote, there is the vivid suggestion of color and the feeling of light and air as of a sunshiny but windy day when cloud shadows are scattered all over the landscape and break up its unity. When describing Twilight East Hampton, he wrote that the plate was, quote, of extraordinary power and beauty. This plate alone would be sufficient to establish the artist's claim to rank, rank among the masters of landscape etching. Uh, the same year, 1881, Nemo Moran sent four of her etchings to the first exhibition of the newly organized Royal Society of Painter, Etchers, and Engravers in London. She was the only woman of the society's 65 original fellows, and they knew she was a woman when they elected her. <laughs> Um, and once she was elected to the society, we actually have um, her, her diploma here, she then submitted a view of East Hampton here of, of the Goose Pond as her diploma work. And a critic reviewing um, her print for the London Daily News um, actually mistook her work for a man, uh, referring to her as Mr. Moran, um, simply saying that it was so masculine. Um, so there's always these, these gendered terms used to describe her and her work. The gendered reception of her work was commonplace not only with critics abroad, but also in the United States. Um, one critic, Mariana von Rensselaer, writing in the Century Magazine in 1883, noted that Mary Nemo Moran's work would, quote, never reveal her sex, according, that is, to the popular idea of feminine characteristics. It is, above all things, direct, emphatic, and bold, exceeding in these qualities perhaps that of any of her male co-workers. Uh, Van Rensselaer also noted that Miss Moran is, quote, as yet the only woman who is a member of the New York Etching Club, and no name stands higher on its role. And I believe that this is really an accurate assessment of Mary Nemo Moran's prominence within the movement, as her works were exhibited and published with incredible frequency, and she received a proportionately large amount of attention from the press. 
1884, uh, the Morans permanently moved to East Hampton, building the town's first permanent artist home studio on Main Street, which we'll, we'll have a chance to see momentarily. Living in East Hampton provided both Thomas and Mary Moran with extended access to the landscape, inspiring a number of etched and painted works. They also contributed to the town's growing artist colony, hosting salons and small gallery shows in their parlor, and their home became a popular meeting place for intellectuals, writers, and artists who were visiting East Hampton from New York City. Their proximity to the city was incredibly important, however, as they worked closely with printers, publishers, and dealers to produce and sell works, always exhibiting their depictions of East Hampton within an urban context. Mary Nemo Moran actively exhibited works in the 80s and 90s with the New York Etching Club, the National Academy of Design, the Brooklyn Art Institute, excuse me, the Brooklyn Art Association, uh, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, the Art Institute of Chicago, the list goes on and on and on. Um, her etchings were also published in several deluxe portfolios, including um, Sylvester Curler's original etchings by American artists, uh, and another periodical entitled Gems of American Etchings. And many prominent dealers, such as Frederick Keppel and Christian Klackner, commissioned and published her work, often buying her, purchasing her plates from her, and then printing large editions. The popularity of her work reflected the continued popularity of etching in America, and at times it was even referred to uh, not simply as a revival, but as a kind of etching craze or mania. And as the number of artists who practice etching grew, so too did the number of exhibitions dedicated to their work. A truly historic moment occurred in 1887, when Sylvester Curler, uh, recognizing the sustained popularity of etching among women artists, organized the first exhibition dedicated solely to the work of women. Entitled The Exhibition of the Work of Women Etchers of America, I don't want to say that five times fast, um, the show was held at the Museum of Fine Arts Boston and it included 388 works by 23 women artists, including 54 etchings by Mary Nemo Moran. Um, she was the, uh, the artist represented most in the show. In the catalog's introduction, Curler wrote, quote, an exhibition made up entirely of the work of women hardly needs to be introduced today with the words of excuse or explanation. Whatever may be thought of the movement in favor of the, quote, emancipation of women, it must be admitted that it is a sign of the times which cannot be ignored. He went on to note that of late, women had made great contributions in the fields of art and design, and that the exhibition was aimed to illustrate that, quote, nowhere else has etching been practiced by female hands as enthusiastically and as assiduously as in the United States. The following year, in 1888, an expanded version of this exhibition traveled from Boston to New York City, where it was exhibited at the Union League Club, and Nemo Moran's prints were actually selected to serve as the frontispiece to the exhibition's catalog. Um, while Curler, uh, his words and organizing efforts may seem very progressive for the era, there were actually many women who were radically rejecting this uh, notion of separating, uh, of exhibiting women's work in a separate sphere. Mary Cassatt, for instance, told her dealer, Paul Duran Ruel, that her works were never to be exhibited in the amateur exhibitions of women artists in America. Those are her words. <laughs> And Analia Merritt, who we heard from earlier, also spoke out against a separate sphere for women's work, writing, quote, recent attempts to make separate exhibitions of women's work were in opposition to the views of the artist concerns, of the artist concerned, who knew that it would lower their standard and risk the place they already occupied. We strongly desire, what we strongly desire is a place in the larger field. The kind ladies who wish to distinguish us as women would unthinkingly do us harm. Although Mary Nemo Moran never wrote about her own feelings towards uh, exhibitions of women's work, her sentiments must not have been too oppositional. For in 1893, she contributed 12 etchings to the Women's Building at the uh, World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago. In fact, her inclusion in these great exhibitions uh, enhanced her reputation. as She was often singled out for her achievements and recognized as a leading figure among her female contemporaries. At the World's Fair, where she exhibited, I believe it was 12 prints in total, she was awarded a Medal of Honor and a diploma uh, by the then judge Emily Sartan, who was um, of Philadelphia, of the famous Sartan family, and a printmaker herself. Now, unfortunately, by the early 1890s, the market was completely oversaturated with painter, painter etchings, as they were called, and these works really began to lose favor with critics and collectors. 
And as the etching craze began to die down in the early 90s, it appears that Mary Nemo Moran stopped producing new prints, although she did continue to exhibit, publish, and sell works that she had previously executed. Um, instead, by the mid-1890s, it seems that she actually returned uh, her attention to painting. Uh, she hadn't exhibited publicly a work for almost 13 years, but in 1896, she exhibited a, a work entitled Spring Blossoms at the National Academy of Design. Her landscapes of this later period focused on scenes in and around her beloved garden uh, of the, in the home, or around her home uh, in East Hampton, and stylistically, they're quite different from her earlier Barbizon-inspired landscapes. Instead, um, these later works speak to the growing popularity of American Impressionism at this moment with a much brighter color palette and looser brush stroke. And it's interesting to contemplate the direction that her art may have taken over the next uh, decades. But unfortunately, as you may know, she died a very untimely death in 1899, cutting her life and career short. Uh, 1899, oh, there was an, actually an outbreak of typhoid fever on Long Island's East End, originating in Montauk, where there was an auxiliary naval base housing soldiers who had returned from Cuba during the Spanish-American War. And after nursing her daughter Ruth Moran back to health from the disease, Nemo Moran herself fell ill and then passed away on September 25th, 1899, at the age of 57. Her death was absolutely devastating for Thomas Moran. Uh, as their daughter Ruth wrote, quote, Moran's sense of loss was overwhelming. His relationship with Molly had always, Molly was his nickname for her, Mary, <laughs> had always been warm and close and strong. His career as an artist had been a chief concern of hers. She had watched his work grow and had done all she could to smooth, smooth his way. The bereavement plunged him into a numbed, numbed depression of spirit. Uh, nevertheless, eight years after his wife's death, Thomas Moran painted this picture, The Old Bridge Over Hook Pond, an oil painting that appears to have been based on Mary Nemo Moran's 1883 etching, Tween the Gloaming and the Murk. Moran's insertion of a female figure on the bridge may have been an homage to his wife, paying tribute to her life and career as a noteworthy American printmaker and influential interpreter of the American landscape. Thank you. I'd be oh, happy to ahead. answer any questions if you have them. Yeah. I just want to know, did it ever cause, and I don't really want to use the word jealousy, but did it ever cause any problems? I mean, she never, they never put a, made her as popular as a husband. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was whether or not there seemed to have been any jealousy between the two of them. I don't, I have not found signs of that, actually. Um, she seemed to be a real supporter of Thomas Moran, understood the importance of his work and, and what he was capable of achieving, and she, I think, really wanted to assist him in the best way that she could. Um, although it did sort of uh, limit her own artistic ability, she, she did make a way for herself nonetheless, and I, I don't really get the sense that there was much jealousy there, no. Yes. Uh, you didn't speak much about the uh, financials of the Moran family. Mm. Extremely successful. I mean, with this output, I would imagine. Right. So. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, she's wondering about the financials of the Moran family. So they both came from immigrant working class families. So initially, um, uh, you know, they struggled. And Thomas Moran, early on working in Philadelphia, was resilient. I mean, he would just, he was producing works endlessly, trying to make a life and a career for himself. And so initially, I think they, they probably struggled a little bit financially. But in 1872, when he painted his Grand Canyon of the Yellowstone, um, it was a picture that sold for $10,000 to the United States Congress. And it was at that point in time that it took them from being probably, you know, modest of a modest uh, financial bracket uh, way, way up above. And then um, I think because they had that working class background, both of them, I mean, even though Thomas Moran was so successful, he never stopped working. He would do prints and illustrations constantly, commercial commissions all the time, Christmas cards. I mean, he never really took a break. He was uh, constantly, constantly going. But I think it sort of speaks to his, their, their background and their worth, work ethic. Yes? About how many oils did she do? Okay, so um, 
That's a good question. It, it was, uh, how many oil paintings did she do? Uh, it's, it's somewhat difficult to say. I think I've identified about five uh, in existence. Um, I think she produced much more than that. And the only way, as, as her own daughter said, she did not keep any records of her own paintings, which is incredibly frustrating. So we have to go based on exhibition records. And so we know that probably over the course of her career, she painted and exhibited between 15 and 20 oil paintings. Um, but that's just what she exhibited. She could have produced many, many more. So um, I hope that my work and my research on her will, will bring to light more examples that some of them come to the market every so often, uh, such as the, the beautiful little scene which I showed here. Whoops. Oh, well, oh well. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to exit. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so, um, let's see, so she had three children, and I don't believe, Richard, you can correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe any of those children had children. Um, yeah, there, there are Moran, because there were seven Morans, there are lots of Moran family descendants, but on the sort of Thomas and Mary Nemo Moran side, I don't, I don't believe there are, no. Yes. Oh, okay, so um, the question was what museum has the majority of her work? So, um, interestingly, it's the Thomas Gilcrease Museum in Tulsa, Oklahoma. <laughs> um, Thomas Gilcrease was a great collector of American Western art, and at one point in time, he essentially bought the contents of the Moran studio, um, which included all of Mary Nemo Moran's, um, all, not all, but several of her prints, um, but all of her sketchbooks, her copper plates, um, so they have the, the largest holdings. And I did, I, when I was doing my research for this, uh, for my dissertation, I spent two weeks out there. I looked at every single work and I cataloged every single one. And what's interesting about that collection is that it actually includes examples of uh, things that I had not found previously, like artist proofs, trial proofs. Um, because it was the contents of the studio, this was sort of her, how she was working things out. Um, and so it gave me a, a really great understanding of her process and her technique. Um, all of the sketches that I showed are in the Gilcrease's collection. Um, but mostly every major American museum, especially on the, um, on the East Coast, has examples. We have about 50 of her prints at the Met. Um, you find them at the MFA Boston and Philadelphia, uh, all up and down the Eastern Seaboard. Yes? How old was he when he passed? He died in 1926, which is kind of incredible. And he was born in 37, so 89, I guess. Yeah, he lived a very, very long time uh, and continued to paint almost up until his death. Um, in 1916, he actually settled in Santa Barbara, California, and so lived out his last years there. So which yes. studio did the Gilcrest buy from? East Hampton, yes. New York City? Oh. Yes, exactly. So yeah, the Gilcrest purchased from the studio here in East Hampton, or the contents that were here in East Hampton. Mm -hmm. It's too bad. Any other questions? No, thank you. Thank you.